The Old Testament is jam-packed with God's promises to Israel. However, traditional Christian theology appropriates these promises for the church, denying the Jewish people the glorious future the prophets foretold for them. Our guest today is the founder of First Fruits of Zion, and we're going to talk about what God has in store for the Jewish people and what that means for the followers of Yeshua. Messiah Podcast is brought to you by First Fruits of Zion, reconciling disciples with God's prophetic promises to Israel. Put your hand and mind together. We will walk in harmony. Let me introduce you to my teacher, the rabbi from the Galilee. Well, welcome back to Messiah Podcast, where Jesus is Jewish, and that changes everything. I'm Jacob Franzak. I'm here with my co-host and producer, Stephanie Hammond. What's poppin', Steph? It's a beautiful day here in North Carolina, albeit a little bit cold, but it's okay. I've got my honey citrus mint tea and had a little pumpkin loaf this morning. I'm, I'm off to a great start. Ooh. I hope you are too. Is it spring yet where you are? All of our plants died Oh no! because it froze. Oh, that sounds like spring. <laughs> our little greenhouse failed. And uh, so for like the third year in a row, the plants we started are dead. So uh, I'm very sorry to hear that. Well, anyway, on that light note, we have a VSG today on the podcast. A VSG. Would you enlighten me as to that term? A very special guest. Oh, okay. Um, our boss's boss is here. That's right. Uh, Boaz Michael, all the way from Jerusalem, the city of the great king. And he's going to explain why First Fruit Design has recently changed its mission statement from Messianic Jewish teaching for Christians and Jews to reconciling disciples with God's prophetic promises to Israel. You know what? I'm glad we're finally going to clear all that up. I've been wondering myself uh, what the inspiration was behind the change. I'm behind both statements, so I can't wait to hear everything Boaz has to say about that. Yeah, yeah, we're going to learn about that. We're going to talk a little bit about the history of First Fruits of Zion, the struggle against replacement theology, what exactly God has promised the Jewish people, and what all that means for disciples of Yeshua. All this and more on this episode of Messiah Podcast. If you want to know the Jewish Jesus, don't miss out on a free subscription to Messiah Magazine, where you'll discover his life and teaching, learn about the biblical festivals, and get connected with Israel. Subscribe for free at messiahmagazine.org. Messiah Magazine is a free, donation-supported quarterly publication of First Fruits of Zion. Well, welcome, Boaz Michael, to Messiah Podcast. It's good to have you here. Great to be here. I feel like I've just joined the cool club getting on the Messiah podcast. Yeah, you've graduated to to the from the founder to now you're in the podcast. This is the big leagues. <laughs> I heard that first fruit design was it was it was just it was like a, a a Microsoft thing. You started it in the garage by yourself or with your wife or uh, <laughs> it was it was just a really small little operation pr printing out leaflets or pamphlets or something take take us back to the beginning and what was what were you trying to do at that time well at the time i would say um i would say it was more zionistic in nature more zionistic more newsy more like about news from israel trying to uh, make american christians aware of of what was taking place on a on a social and a developmental level with the land of israel but that quickly shifted. That that changed pretty rapidly. It shifted from being Zionistic, newsy, into the development of an organization that was primarily focused on on education and theology mm. in regards to uh, the development of Christian faith within the context of what is commonly called uh, the Jewish roots. So the organization started in 1992. Mm. This is before like digital design. Everything was done by cut and paste on light boards. Um, oh, wow. So in 1992, we started a monthly uh, newspaper that was distributed 
throughout the Denver area. And then from there, things really started rolling. In 1993 is when we started the Torah Club, okay. which was, at the time, just a commentary on the Parsha hmm. uh, from a Messianic Jewish perspective. And we had uh, contributors from Israel starting to contribute to our monthly teachings. And during that time, we were collecting articles for the, the publication um, and we were doing a series of articles on the Torah, on the, the value of Torah. And after a couple of years, we took those articles and we put them together in a book called Torah Rediscovered. Hmm. And that was uh, written by a gentleman by the name of Ariel Berkowitz. And that book really started the awakening of what can be called the Torah movement. Hmm. Now, it didn't answer any big questions. It was just... It was just simply putting out there that the Torah wasn't done away with. Yeah. Well, it opens up a lot of doors, just that entire concept mm -hmm. <laughs> for many different people. Yeah. But you'd say that the work of Torah Club, the work of FFOZ, is mainly about restoration. Would you say that? We didn't intend the organization to kind of develop as it did and as rapidly it did. So we didn't start out with a group of people, a think tank that were saying, okay, what's our mission? What's our vision? What's our direction? What are we going to try to accomplish? All these types of things. It was more just... You know, my wife and I just at that light board, just putting out information and it just kind of grew from there. But we did start the organization with what we considered four restorations. And those restorations have remained the foundation of our work. They've never changed. They've they've been our focus point that we've rallied around through these these years, these past 30 years in focusing our work with the intention in terms of what we're doing, why we're doing it, and those types of things. And those were our heart to restore a Jewish Messiah, to bring him back to the, his Jewish brothers and sisters, take him back from the nations that have defined him outside of Judaism and bring Yeshua back within Judaism. So there's a restoration taking place there. Our heart was also and is also to restore the Jewish people. And that's in a sense of, I, I would say, voicing to the nations God's continued covenantal relationship with the Jewish people and restoring the Jewish people back to the center of reading how the Bible is read and how the Bible is understood and seeing essentially Israel at the center of God's uh, plan, both historically and prophetically. Yes. Then the the one that a lot of people kind of rally around is the restoration of the Torah. And our heart there is really just to establish, restore the authority of the Word of God in the life of, of God's people, both the Jews and, the, and, and Gentiles, and giving them a foundation to stand upon as we navigate life in the world that we, we, we live. This goes to the the credibility of, of God and the credibility of the Bible, that God doesn't change. I guess that's the simplest way to say it. He established a covenant in the Torah. And so we want to establish the authority of the Torah because of how it undermines the Bible when theologies come along and say the Torah has been done away with. Yeah. And then the fourth restoration that we really established from the beginning was to restore a Jewish reading of the gospel. And the key to that is understanding the, the often repeated phrase of repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So restoring a Jewish gospel really requires understanding the concept of the kingdom, the objective of Yeshua in terms of, of establishing that kingdom, and our hope that one day that that kingdom will be established. And this is this is uh, in alignment with broader Judaism's, uh, you know, prayer and hope that the kingdom, the Mahut, will be established and that the um, God's name will be revered throughout the world and His name will be one and the peace will come and that the Jewish people will be restored and everything that the kingdom uh, represents and and that's right in line with that's uh, right at the center of our work. Yeah, well, I think putting that repentance back in there is important. Too. I mean, for me, coming from like a, a background where it was just like, just say a prayer and believe if you believe the words that you said, like, that's all you have to do, like, actually. But um, to hear that call to repentance, uh, that's a game changer. 
the full understanding of the centrality of the kingdom wasn't really part of our the foundation of this work as well. I mean, as as we developed and as we grew, we started uh, finding out about our what we call our Messianic Jewish luminaries, mm-hmm. Jewish rabbis, Jewish thinkers uh, that were coming to faith in the late in the mid mid to late eighteen hundreds. And as they came to faith, they were bringing a thoroughly and fundamentally Jewish perspective to Yeshua faith. And as we started reading their works and translating their works from Russian, from Bulgarian, uh, from Hebrew, and we tried to started translating them into English and exposing them to our constituents, but also probably maybe perhaps selfishly, most importantly to us, they really started transforming our entire uh, theology. So, for example, you know, Paul Philip Levertov was the first luminary that we republished through our publishing arm, Vine of David. Mm. It was called Love in the Messianic Age. It's a short read. It's a it's it's a dense read. So even though it's short, it's 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 intense. But he really kind of awakened us to the centrality of the kingdom. So I would say at that time, you know, First Fruits of Zion was about restoring the Torah, restoring the Torah, restoring the Torah, or, you know, Mm. becoming Torah observant, becoming Torah observant. And what really changed for us when we read his work was that the Torah is important and honoring God and and being faithful to God and his commandments is important. But that's that's one component of the kingdom. Mm. You know, when you centralize and you focus on the kingdom, then Torah observance kind of comes along with that. But also faith in the Messiah is a kingdom act. It's a preemptive act that we're jumping ahead of the kingdom. We're acknowledging Yeshua as the Messiah. So that's that's a that's a kingdom perspective. Mm. Um, doing good deeds, building the kingdom one mitzvah at a time. You know, providing for the sick, providing for the poor, providing for the hungry, all of those components are aspects of the kingdom. So this really shifted our 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 languaging and our focus from being just an organization that was pounding the drum of, you know, Torah, Torah observance, you know, Torah for Christians, all of this concept to saying it's all about the kingdom. Mm-hmm. The kingdom is big and broad. The, the kingdom is made up of Jews, Gentiles. It's made up of all nations. The commandments apply differently to all of God's people. And as God's people uh, keep the mitzvot, the commandments, as it applies to them, they're participating in the revelation of the kingdom. Mm. They're revealing the kingdom. Hmm. So that was a big shift for us. Well, and this is... Um... You know, all of these things, First Future Design has been um, trying to get people to understand all of this stuff. And, you know, it, it has been, uh, you know, education, an educational organization, which is really reflected, I think, in the, in the previous mission statement quite clearly. But I wanted to ask, with the, with the change in mission statement, has the mission changed or is this just now, is it just now clearer exactly what we're trying to accomplish? So the new mission statement is reconciling disciples with God's prophetic promises to Israel. Our mission statement that we've had for the past 15 years is, you know, Messianic Jewish teaching for Christians and Jews. That's pretty sterile. It's it's just a matter of publishing books, publishing content, you know, uh, sharing ideas, and we're accomplishing our mission. Yeah. Now, in 2018, we launched... Uh, the the new Torah club. And we were very specific and intentional in using language when we launched the new Torah club to say that First Fruits of Zion is no longer about creating books or commentary sets. First Fruits of Zion is now in the, the mission of investing in leaders and building small communities of people from around the world that are gathering together physically, coming together and studying uh, through the Torah, studying through Jewish text, and building some type of a community and accountability. And I think that's where I think the word reconciling has strength. It's a beautiful thing to see, you know, the nations now 
in an organized and constructive manner, studying alongside the Jewish people in the weekly Parsha. Yeah. And, you know, gathering together in homes or in congregations or coffee shops and and reading the same text that the Jewish people are 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 reading through uh, in the synagogue. And that's a small form of reconciliation. Mm. And we've been on the forefront of, right. of inserting Jewish thought, Jewish commentary, Jewish understanding into our writing where Christians are, I think, softening to the influence of the sages, of our, of our teachers, of our rabbis, and their interpretations of the text. And I think that is in some way removing this this uh, straw man that the church has created for for centuries of like this the Pharisee or the 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 Jewish people or the Jewish interpretation yeah and it's right. it's opening them up to accessing Jewish content reading that content learning from that content coming closer to the Jewish people um, respecting Jewish interpretation so there's a form of reconciliation that's taking uh taking place there through our Torah club, through our resources, becoming more appreciative of the uh, Jewish interpretation, historical Jewish interpretation of the text. So one thing about this term reconciliation that um, I'd like to explore a little bit is reconciliation implies a schism or a divorce or a conflict. Mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of us, like myself included, they might think, well, I don't need to be reconciled with those promises. I already, I already know what all that means. But historically, mm -hmm. like for most of Christian history, there, there is like a pro there has been like a problem, right? Like those, there is a real need on like a broad level for the church to be reconciled with these prophecies in the Old Testament where God says, I'm going to take my people, the people of Israel, I'm going to bring them back to the land and I'm going to restore them and they're going to be faithful to the Torah. So with all that stuff in the Bible, I mean, it's just right there in the Bible, clear as can be. How did it happen that we that we ended up in a situation where, you know, millions and millions of followers of Yeshua need to be reconciled with these things? How did it become unreconciled? What 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 happened? Well, um, Jacob, I appreciate you greatly because you are a great thinker and you could probably answer this question far better than I could, but really it boils down to um, an early decision or decisions of the early church to intentfully define themselves as, as to the antithesis of Judaism. Yes. Now we call this replacement theology. We call this supersessionism. Mm. Um, and it's, it's, in my opinion, it's evil, but it's also, uh, systemic within, uh, Christian mm. theology. You can meet incredibly wonderful, uh, good hearted Christians who would say, I love Israel. I love the Jewish people, but yet their theology and the way that they approach their theology in terms of God's continued relationship with the Jewish people, God's, yeah. um, uh, promises being fulfilled to the Jewish people would still condemn the Jewish people. Mm. Um, and, and in some way, that is a form of uh, a very subtle and innocent form of anti-Semitism that exists within um, aspects of church theology, but it all is rooted. I don't blame any modern day Christian for any of that stuff. They're just, they've, they're recipients of a theology that's been handed down. But where that theology started was with intention to define Jesus' faith, Yeshua' faith, as the antithesis or the opposite of its Jewish foundations, or to say that more strongly, to define Yeshua' faith outside of Judaism, because Jesus and his disciples were a part of Judaism. The apostles were a part of Judaism. Uh, Yeshua faith was a sect within Judaism at the time of of the resurrection. Yeah, and now most Christians would sit back and say, "Oh, Judaism, it's that's you know." I, you know Think of these charts that you used to see, like in Christian bookstores, where it defines all of the cults, 
and it gives the different definitions of a cult. Yeah. <laughs> and Judaism is right wow. there, you know, as a as a yeah. cult because of you know a variety <laughs> of reasons. We're attempting to reconcile. So using that word intentfully, reconcile disciples of Yeshua. And with a specific, we do have a specific focus on the nations, mm. so Gentiles, mm -hmm. Gentile disciples, so Christians. We want to reconcile them back with the uh, the foundation of their faith when it was still a Judaism. Yeah, so important. Well, I think people have been people have been conditioned to see to read those prophecies and to think, oh, those are those are mine. Like in some way, this is all about me. It's all about the Christians, yes, yes. and um, you know who cares about the Jewish people anymore? They the Jewish people spiked the ball at, at the ten yard line, and now we get to carry it the rest of the way, and we leave them behind. And and when you, and and it's hard to take something like that away from someone if they're reading Jeremiah thirty one and thinking this is all for me to to, to go mm -hmm. and tell them. Well, actually, this is for Israel, and um, you you can. Uh, it is for you in a way through Yeshua, mm -hmm. um, and, and by God's grace, you can be included. But it's talking about the Jewish people. Like that's, I think that's difficult for people. It is, and you know, I was I was reluctant. I mean, we worked on our new mission statement for quite a while. I was I was reluctant to use the word reconcile in a sense because I didn't want it to be compared to what's taking place in the world today, which is a good thing. But it's not us, and it's not what we're doing, which is Jewish Christian relations. Yeah, Jewish Christian mm -hmm. relations has like more of kind of an ecumenical feel to it, where these two parallel truths just you know are side by side, and they're trying to be at peace with one another, and that's positive and that's good. But the work of First Root Design is something. Uh, 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 it's it's something a bit deeper in the sense of saying, wait a minute. In order for there to be real reconciliation back with where things kind of went off off the rails, Christians are going to have to change a lot. Christians are going to have to begin to understand um, God's relationship with the Jewish people, the centrality of the Jewish people, the promises to the Jewish people, and how they fit into that, not the other way around, not how Jews fit into a Christian uh, point of view or Christian theological construct. Yeah. So. It's a complex world that we navigate. Uh, I just I had the honor yesterday of um, doing a tour here in Jerusalem that introduces uh, tourists to Mount Zion, mm -hmm. to Hart Zion. We go to one of our other luminaries, uh, Messianic Jewish luminaries, her house. It's on Mount Zion. Her name was Pauline Rose. And she established a beautiful home there, which became um, a Messianic place of gathering you could call it the first one of the first messianic synagogues congregations communities in the new state of of Israel and i love taking people there at the end of this tour because there's this massive massive uh, jacaranda tree in the corner of the yard hmm. and jacaranda trees uh, are more native to like South Africa, which is where Pauline Rose was from. Mm. And this tree now is 60, 70 feet tall. It's blossoming. It's beautiful. It produces beautiful purple flowers. Now, when she wanted to plant that tree in her garden, her gardeners um, told her that it's going to die, that it's not native to this area, that it's, it's not going to take root. And she has this beautiful quote where she says that the gardener's skepticism could not uh, quench her faith. And then she says this, there would be an answer to my prayer for a blessing on this little sapling, which held mysteriously within itself a promise of future beauty. And I love ending the tour there because I, I link that to Messianic Judaism. Mm. In a sense, Messianic Judaism is not supposed to take root. Uh, it's not supposed to to become, you know, something glorious or, um, you know, significant. It, it's like we're the oddballs. <laughs> you know, we're not we're not planted in this in the soil of Judaism. We're not planted within mm. the soil of Christianity. But yet, just as this tree held within it this mystery, 
of 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 the promise of a future beauty. Mm. I believe Messianic Judaism has that same promise. I believe that Messianic Judaism has within itself this mysterious uh, promise of the future uh, beauty of faith, and so we're we're presenting ideas that are challenging both to Christianity and Judaism. And we are an organization that is working towards reconciling the people of God in order that the kingdom of heaven can be realized. Amen. That's beautiful. Let's talk about some of these prophetic promises to Israel that God has made. What are they and what do they have to do with the church? Well, first of all, I think it's 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 important. I think there's some language in the book of Ephesians that's helpful um, when it comes to um speaking to Christians about their connection to the promises of, of God that he made to the people of Israel. So in Ephesians 2, you know, 11 through 13 is a pretty classic text. It says, remember that at that time you were separate from Messiah, excluded from citizenship into Israel and foreigners to the covenants of promise without hope and without God in the world. But now through the Messiah Yeshua, you who are once far away have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah. So you have this text that's speaking about at one point the nations were separated yes. from the covenants of promise. Mm -hmm. And now through the work of Messiah, they've been brought near. So the nations are participating in the promises that God has made to the people of Israel. Yeah. Um, Ephesians 2, 19 through 20 reiterates this and it says, you are no longer foreigners or strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people. So there's this connection that's being made for the nations to come alongside and to see themselves as recipients and participants in the promises that God made to Israel. So what are those? Uh, the restoration of of Israel, Ezekiel 37, Jeremiah 31, where Israel will be restored. It will be the light to the nations. It, it is where the revelation of God will be will go forth from to to the entire world, the establishment of the of of the temple, mm -hmm. Ezekiel uh, forty through forty eight, Zechariah six speak about the establishment of of the kingdom with King Messiah ruling and reigning, the messianic age. This is something that's physical and literal, and a lot of. Unfortunately, a lot of uh, Christian denominations have spiritualized this, or there's mm. confusion between the kingdom of heaven and the world to come and these types of things. I think it's important that we have a, 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 a literal understanding of the, the establishment of the kingdom of this world, uh, essentially being, you know, uh, call it heaven on earth, mm. um, which coincides with the master's prayer when he says, you know, you know, will, that your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. So this idea that this earth becomes a reflection of heaven, just as the temple tabernacle re is reflected upon the heavenly tabernacle, this world becomes that, that translucent reflection of the ideal of, of heaven. The ingathering of the exiles, you know, this is a promise of, of, of the kingdom, the Jewish people, were burdened with, I think it's fair to mm. say, um, the responsibility of the Torah, our lack of faithfulness to that Torah has has brought tremendous pain and suffering. This is unfortunately, it's you know prophesied in Deuteronomy 30 and other texts like Isaiah 43 and Jeremiah 32 that speak about the ingathering of the Jewish people, but that's as a result of the pain of the exile, mm -hmm. the pain of of being dispersed. And then, of course, uh, the big one, uh, the promise of the new covenant. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, it's the new covenant is not the New Testament. Um, <laughs> the, new the, new, the, the new covenant is written on our hearts. Mm -hmm. It's not written on paper. Mm -hmm. And it's it results in obedience and it's mm -hmm. transformative. And that's a promise given to the to the Jewish people. And to those that attach themselves to God's promises to our people. That idea of, of exiles, powerful. I think um, 
part of restoring the Jewish people for me has been internalizing this idea of exile because it's so easy as like a traditional Christian to think, oh, this is it, right? The church is it, the church is the kingdom, and the church mm. is going to like be victorious and convert everybody. And then like that's uh, wherever the church is like has cultural influence and like hegemony, that's the kingdom, like Christendom is... And mm. once, but but when you learn that the Jewish people are still in exile, and by definition the kingdom has not come in its fullness, then I th like I've learned to see myself as living in exile because I'm I'm a citizen of a of a better country, like Hebrews mm. says. That's not it's not here yet. In, a, mm. in a, it's not like manifested in a physical way. Um, just like that one shift has been worth the price of admission for me. Right? I mean, it just it makes my life and everything around me make so much more yeah. sense. This is exile. This we're not yeah. there yet, you know. Well, and it is Israel centric, but when God's promises are filled fulfilled to the people of Israel, when exile ends and redemption comes uh, as promised to the people of Israel, then the prophets speak of how the whole world will experience redemption, mm -hmm. how the whole world will have a revelation of God, how the whole world will enter into a period of peace and those types of things. So it's the, the action is on, on behalf of God's covenant and promises that he made to our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as foretold of the, by the prophets of Israel, but that action on behalf of God's relationship with the Jewish people has mm -hmm. ramifications to the entire world. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's not just Jewish or Israel centric. It it's God being faithful to his promises, the one true God of Israel, the Jewish Messiah, being faithful, and as a result, the entire world mm -hmm. enters into a different era of time when the kingdom is established. Would you say we've had some success in this area of reconciliation, either with pastors and leaders who might have been impacted by it or or at the Brahm Center in Jerusalem? Have you seen evidence of it? Well, I yes, absolutely. I, I think that, you know, we, you know, we've been with God's help and God's strength, we've been doing this for a long time now, 30 years. Mm -hmm. And there uh, there is a shift, but there's I I, th I would I would say that our victories are, are very small. Mm. We still are we're still um, struggling against a narrative that is thousands of years old. I would even say there's a cost to adopting these ideas. There's a sense of of spiritual concern that people begin to have for you as a Christian when you begin to adopt a, a Israel centric theology. When you begin to interpret the Gospels from a Jewish perspective, there's red flags that are raised with pastors and elders, and you know, and we've seen you know. Uh, difficult situations for some of our Torah clubs that are thriving, growing, and blossoming. I mean, we have a, a Torah club group in uh, Oil City, Pennsylvania, that is now multiplied to 10 different Torah clubs in that area. Wow. That's amazing. So you see like a spiritual renewal taking place, which is incredible. It is. But yet the pastors that have... Right you know, 25 people in their church are coming against the work of the Torah mm -hmm. club because it's it's something that is not in alignment with their uh, historical mm -hmm. doctrines of their particular denominations. Mm. It's a small enough community where that actually makes a, <laughs> yeah. a difference and impact. It's not just one email. Exactly. So in terms of reconciliation, I would say in those instances, I mean, part of our goal is when we talk about reconciling disciples i mean we're intentful in using the word disciples when you hear that word you tend to think of of gentiles more than jews but there are jewish disciples <laughs> thank, um, thank god but yes. we want we want uh we want christians to have a renewed sense of the mystery of the bible mm -hmm. i think that's been lost within christianity because it's been so engineered over the mm -hmm. years that that people just are maybe bored with with the, with the Bible, mm. um, when you introduce a a Jewish reading of the text and it begins to challenge you again, and you have to start searching and digging, there's a a reconciliation that takes place of people's own faith 
that they are renewed in the joy of their salvation. We've, I over the years, I've probably heard, you know, hundreds if not thousands of times, people coming up and saying that this understanding of the Bible has caused them to feel the the joy of salvation again. Mm. Yeah. That they're mm. that they're energized with their faith. Exactly. Yeah. Too. So yes, that's taking place uh, every day through different parts of the world. We just launched a, a, a beautiful Torah club that is in Indonesia. Wow. And Indonesia is ripe with Jew hatred and mm. um, with anti-Semitism. Um, and to see disciples there beginning to identify and align with the people of Israel is a powerful thing. Um, wow. And it it's a Ultimately, it's a testimony to the Jewish people in a sense as well, because the in the name of Jesus, he is fulfilling one of the key roles of the Jewish Messiah, which is to mm -hmm. send uh, the message of the God of Israel to all nations. Yeah, which has never happened before. Exactly. And it's beautiful to see that happening in the name of, under the banner of Torah, mm -hmm. the Torah club, that these Christians are aligning with the Jewish people. And... You know, our goal is to have 10,000 Torah clubs within the next nine to 10 years. Mm -hmm. And as that footprint is established, I know that that's going to have significant impact on uh, the Jewish people in terms of them seeing Jesus slightly differently than how they see him now. Mm. For who he really is. Yep. In terms of the Brahm Center, uh, which is here in Jerusalem, it's our uh, our learning center. It's it's supported by our First Roots of Zion friends. You know, we're not evangelistic, so we're not here trying to mm -hmm. to you know pass out tracts and to yeah. evangelize Jewish people. We have we have a lot of work to do, uh, and we don't need to focus on that. That's we'll 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 place that responsibility on on the Holy Spirit. We have thousands, tens of thousands of Jews that have come to faith in Jesus um, as they've traveled the world or as the Holy Spirit has opened up their eyes to, to the Messiah. But unfortunately, the vast majority of Jews that have come to faith here in Israel have taken a, a Christian understanding of, of, of Jesus, that he came to do away with the Torah, mm -hmm. that he's, in, he's, he's at the antithesis of Judaism, that he has created a new religion that is based upon grace and not on the mitzvot. Yeah. So the work of the Brahm Center is, is really to, to reach out to those individuals and to begin to educate them in terms of what their responsibilities are as Jews that have devotion to the Messiah to continue to live Jewish lives. Um, and you know, we have various programs that take place throughout the week, um, classes. We have a beautiful lunch and learn. So once a week, we uh, we sponsor uh, a, a learning opportunity where we provide lunch. And a bunch of Messianic Jews from the city center that are working, you know, as lawyers or working as, you know, in a, as accountants or in different service industries come together uh, to have an hour and a half of fellowship, of community, of learning, um, of food. So in a sense, yeah, the Brahm Center is fulfilling a sense of reconcili uh, reconciliation there, reconciling these Jewish disciples back to the foundation of Jewish life. And that's that's an, uh, a very important part of our broader mission that's, that is focused on the Jewish people, but um, Jewish, specifically Jewish disciples. Love to hear that. Yeah, that's incredibly important. That's a big part of distinction theology. Mm -hmm. It's hard to have distinction theology when Jewish people aren't living the mitzvot, so that line of distinction is a lot less. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As I tell most of our guests, I'm out here in the in the middle of nowhere, t 10 miles from the meatpacking plant for, um, for Hebrew National Hot Dogs and about uh, two hours from the nearest Orthodox minion. So it's uh, my, my connection to all of this, you know, is through books and through you know uh, talks like this with people who are on the other side of the world. And you know, it's, it's easy for someone in my position to wonder, like, okay, I'm starting to get it. I agree that God's prophetic promises are to Israel. Well, now what? What do I do with that? Yeah. Well, um, I wrote a book. Um, 
uh, titled Tint of David that kind of tries to answer some of those questions, because that is a very difficult thing. Oftentimes, the tendency is when you've been awakened to these ideas of the the, a Jewish reading of the text, the Jewishness of the gospel, the foundation of the Torah, the centrality of Israel, when all of these different types of things begin to like awaken you mm. or awaken inside of you and become part of your theological thinking and your spirituality, it is complex to continue to go to churches that are teaching the opposite of that. Yeah. Um, but I can tell you that isolation is is much worse, mm. and being spiritually isolated and separate from God's people is unhealthy. It's unspiritual, and I don't believe that that's uh, going to help this reconciliation movement move forward if people that are inspired by these ideas leave their churches. Um, so I think that it's very important that people find or stay a part of or find a very healthy church in their area and then ask God to give them opportunity to spread these ideas through relationship, through um, discussion, dialogue, friendship within that church so that they can become agents of the kingdom in their churches that are in the middle of nowhere um, and bring people into these understandings because that's who else is going to reach them? Who else is going to connect with them? Hmm. So exactly, I've been doing this long enough to know that that's not the answer people want to hear. Yeah, It's part of human <laughs> nature to define yourself against something. Hmm. And it's very easy to separate and to say, that's not me. I'm not like them. I'm this. And that's how you get your own sense of self-identity is by you know, pointing fingers at other people. But, mm -hmm. you know, we talked about the Jewish people experiencing a form of exile for thousands of years and the pain of exile. Yeah. I think at times maybe taking on that burden of a sense of exile and being in a place that doesn't feel natural or safe or a, a place of like-mindedness is exile. So maybe people can stay in their churches and, and identify with the exile that the Jewish people have felt mm. within those places of worship uh, for the sake of the kingdom. Really important points, all of them. Boaz, thank you for coming. Thanks for showing up, boss. We appreciate it. <laughs> I think you guys are doing a great job. We're excited about the what, what's happening with the podcast. We, with God's help, will continue to find ways to get this into you know people's headsets and continue to learn and connect with this work and and to use the ideas that are put forward here to challenge ideas and to to bring them into new understandings of their faith amen well i feel like um today the principals sat in the classroom <laughs> uh, to see if the teachers were doing their job. I know. Uh, I think we survived. I think. Uh, what do you think? Uh, I think we did too. I think we came off pretty well. In case no one noticed, we were on our very best behavior. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. It's always it's always really enlightening to speak with Boaz, and we touched on some uh, some really inspirational points today. Yeah, Boaz is sort of the guy with the vision, right? And, and talking to him, it, it always brings you back to sort of why we're here and the the future that we're looking forward to and the future that we're in some small part trying to create um, that kingdom that is that is coming, but that we can participate in now and 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 how that message can impact our world. Yes, I completely agree. I'm uh, I'm really inspired to go on with the rest of my day now. Um, in case anyone wants to do some further reading and exploration of the topics we discussed today, Daniel Lancaster has two books in our store that would prove very helpful. One is called Restoration, and the other is his new commentary, The Holy Epistle to the Ephesians, Sermons on a Messianic Jewish Approach by D. Thomas Lancaster. Highly recommend them. Go check them out in our store at ffoz.org. Well, this has been Messiah Podcast. Until next time, I'm Stephanie Hammond. And I'm Jacob Franzak. Shalom. Shalom. 
Thanks for joining us for this episode of Messiah Podcast, where Jesus is Jewish and that changes everything. This podcast is brought to you by First Fruits of Zion and is an extension of Messiah Magazine. Subscribe for free at messiahmagazine.org. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe and leave a review along with a five-star rating wherever you're listening now. Today's podcast was produced by myself, Stephanie Hammond, and co-hosted with Jacob Fronzak. Our executive producer is Boaz Michael, and the editor-in-chief is Daniel Lancaster. This episode was directed and edited by Jeremy Schoenwald. Original music was written and performed by Joshua Aaron. The show notes for Messiah Podcast were edited by Candy Bishop and are available at messiahpodcast.org. If you're interested in learning more about the Bible from a Messianic Jewish perspective, check out Torah Club, which is an international network of small study groups who meet weekly to discuss the Bible together from a Messianic Jewish perspective. To start a club or join a club, go to TorahClub.org. Until next time, Shalom.